Last year, all the way back through 2003, I think the sets go. The $100 discount if you get them this weekend. So we're almost ready to get rolling. Okay, one finger. I'm not sure what one finger means actually, but at least at least it's a good finger. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of people in the junior. Welcome to the Saturday morning session, 2011 Extraordinary Technology Conference. Our first speaker has been a friend for way over 20 years. Back in 1986, 87, I kept hearing this name, Dale Pond, all over the place. And I'm going, well, this guy sounds interesting. And he was talking about some inventor that I had never heard of and some philosopher I had heard of. And I thought, OK, this sounds like he's an interesting guy. And so I moved to heaven and earth. And we met in Colorado Springs for a lunch at a Chinese restaurant. And you know how some meals in life are totally memorable. And that was one of them. And we've been friends ever since. Uh, visited with Dale in a lot of different places where he's lived over the years. have gotten to watch the growth and development of Atlan. It's really, really been a blessing to know Dale. And that's. You know, just really something. Um, I don't know what else to say because some of what goes on in a friendship like this is way beyond words. So let's welcome Dale Pond. Thanks, Michael. Good morning. Am I turned on here? Um, I want to talk to you about um, a recent discovery I made, <clears throat> having studied John Keeley's work for almost 30 years. And the man is a mystery. It's a mystery wrapped in an enigma, and you pick up his words, many of you have, and they don't make any sense whatsoever. <clears throat> but with persistence and, con and con consistence, we've been able to crack a lot of what he was saying. We're beginning to understand that, and we're beginning to develop engineering modalities, and we're beginning to interface his work, not only with Walter Russell and Edgar Cayce and a few of these other people, but also with modern science and physics, because we want to make this stuff practical. He made machines like this that were designed to be power sources from the 1880s, when the world didn't have a power source. They had water and wind and animal power and steam power, but they didn't have real power to, to power the industries that the world needed. So he developed these machines, and yet we can't understand what he did and how he did it. When we look back and, and do a, a, an intense review of his work, his many, many accomplishments, we find out things like he was splitting the atom in the 1880s all by himself in his own laboratory. How could a man do this? He made many machines like this. He made machines that levitated. Supposedly they were, they were offered uh, throughout different industries. Uh, but the bad guys who had monopolized the power industry at that time, Morgan and Tesla and Edison, this man, John Keeley, scared them. He was going to upset everything they had ever done, all the millions that they invested in their projects, 
And so they built a fence around him so he couldn't get out. And when he died, they erased every mention of him from anywhere in the literature. So it is, we have never found John Keeley's notes, his lab notes. <clears throat> we have never found the books that he wrote. We know they were written. We know they were published. But as far as I know, I'm, uh, they're just gone. I heard of one book in the hands of one guy, but he won't share it. And that's just the way it goes with Keeley. But the discovery that I stumbled on in the past few months was that what Keeley harnessed in these machines is what we're calling today the scalar potential. He recognized that scalar potential. He devised mechanical means to transform that scalar potential into kinetic usable energy. And that's what powered these devices. So once I had that insight, I went and did a whole lot of more research in what scalar is. I read Bearden's book, I read Carol White's book, uh, Raymond's writings, and some of these other high mathematical treatises to get her a better handle on what are they talking about when they say scalar. And I find out that it's a confused mess. As you all know, if you've looked into the scalar thing, you can't really get a good answer or not one you can hang your hat on or build machines with. And, and if you go into the, to uh, Whitaker's work or Raymond's writings, you, you're just mystified with all the mathematics. How many can re read that kind of mathematics? I know I can't, but I can read it enough to get to just to what these people are talking about. And I was able to create a correlation of the bridge between what Keeley was doing, what Tessa was talking about, what Bearden's writing about, um, and that connecting link is mind force. This is uh, from the 1800s by Mr. Max Planck, a foundation of our modern day physics. If a man like Max Planck says this, then we really need to look at this, not shove it under the table because it's an anomaly and we don't know how to interpret it. Let's go see what he was trying to tell us. In our industry, and I consider this movement, this new energy movement and industry, it's just getting started, it's just getting organized, we're just starting to put our feet under, get the ground under our feet. We're trying to identify the source of omnipresent pure scalar potential. What exactly is that? And once we discover that and we understand what it is, we want to transform that potential into usable kinetic energy. So we want to develop power by transforming non-observable, non-motion scalar or mind potential into observable practical kinetic energy. <clears throat> That's what we're all here to do. So to begin with the process, let's start defining, look at some of the definitions of scalar. And that's one of the problems. There's many definitions of scalar. And, uh, or there's definitions of manifestations of scalar taken to be scalar, but it's not. So let's just look at some of these things. The scalar energy is a force or a, or a, a um, potential that is non-discernible. You can't see it, you can't measure it, you can't do anything with it. It's just a pure force in total, complete balance. And then there's a the second part, the kinetic part, when you can do something with that scalar to derive the two basic motions of the universe, which are attraction to a center and, exp and expansion away from that center. These are the two forces involved in all basic wave motions. And from those two motions, we can derive a usable power, as we can see. So we got the scalar force of the sun, for instance, and we can create all these power mechanisms. By the way, the energy that drives these dinosaurs is a scalar transformed into a kinetic energy, the same source that that spins the Earth, that spins galaxies, that spins atoms and molecules will be the same force that drives these dinosaurs. It's not even recognized by science. They don't even have a word for that. 
So what is scalar? Scalar is a potential, and these are metaphors. We're going to use some metaphors here to give you a broader picture of what scalar represents. Instead of trying to read all the chicken scratch mathematics, we'll just look at some real simple things and bring some of this down to our level. If there's, a, if there's only a couple people on the planet who can read that chicken scratch mathematics, what good is it? It's not going to do us much good at all. We need to understand what this stuff is. So we're using a few metaphors. This metaphor is a, a snowbank on top of a mountain. That is energy and potential. It's just energy sitting there in balance, more or less, quietly on top of this mountain. But once we start adding energy, we get a different scenario. Bearden classifies scalar as a quantity considered to be a quantity that has magnitude or size or potential, but it has no motion. So it's just sitting there, just like the snow on top of this mountain. We add a little bit of uh, thermal energy, for instance, and it starts to melt. That is now kinetic energy. And if we accumulate it through attractive accumulation or additive accumulation, we get enough water motion to generate power for our own use. That's a simple thing to look at. So scalar is a quantity of a type, kind, or state of force. And there are many, there are many definitions of that. Uh, we're just trying to be general here. The sun, for instance, could be considered a scalar entity, where there's energy just sitting there in the sun, but only after it comes to our Earth and only after it impacts on atoms and molecules do we feel the heat or the color. For instance, you can't see the light until it hits a molecule. <clears throat> and this also reminds us that there's so many different interpretations of what scalar is. And I've also found out that there are different kinds of scalar. So here's the sun manifesting in a kinetic form, sending its radiations down to the planets. And another interpretation, so now we're going to look at more than just that. Mind force is a potential. And in our human activities, in our human lives, in our mind states, we all live in our minds. Everything we encounter, everything we do is in our mind states. This picture represents on the right-hand side the physical side of life. That's the side we all know about. That's the observable, measurable side. But scalar is immeasurable, which is what she's trying to reach towards. That's the so-called mental state or the spiritual state of mankind. When we bridge that veil, as the old alchemists have done and people like Walter Russell spent 39 days on the other side of that veil, and some of us in here have spent moments, so it'd be epiphanies and eureka moments, that's when you pierce that veil into the greater mind force of the universe. So we go beyond the physical senses, which is the 3D maya or materiality, and move into the scalar side of life, which is non observable, can't measure it. And here's a little kitten we had for a few weeks. It's, it's latent inside that couch cushion, just waiting to get out and just rip everybody apart. So, that, so that's your latent motion, non motion. So what is mind force? There is a celestial mind force. That means a force beyond the physical. Mind force is beyond the physical. That's what the word celestial means. A great sympathetic force, which is life itself, and everything is composed from it. And that was by John Keeley. This life force, this mind force, is the scalar forces. Now, this is uh, Ann Dunham from the Princeton University Pair Proposition Project, uh, Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Project at Princeton University. She was the administrator of the project. The field rate data have shown us that we get effects when we're in groups of people in environments where there are a lot of people who are on the same wavelength. They spent 28 years answering a single question. Does mind effect matter? 
And after 28 years of intensive research, yes, it does. So if Princeton University says mind force is real, telekinesis, remote viewing, all these different manifestations of mind force, then it is real. And we don't have to be bashful about it. When somebody starts poo-pooing the idea that, oh, these are woo-woo new age freaks, you can say, no, this is solid scientific research, and we're going to investigate it. All of these things are challenging any attempts to model them, because these things just don't fit with any of our prevailing understanding of the way the world works. Because our current understandings are based in Newtonian physics, the 3D world, which you can measure and feel and touch. But we want to go beyond the 3D world. There's a whole other universe out there, and it's been ignored. The spiritualists in the past have told us about it. The occultists have talk, tried to tell us about it. Those rare individuals like Yuri Geller and, and, and Pomelo up in Canada, all these people have tried to tell us about this stuff, but we've been inhibited, we've been intimidated, we've been challenged to stay away from that area because when we go to that area, we become liberated. We become empowered as individuals. So it behooves us to really look at this. Okay, what is mind force? All forces in nature are mind forces. Magnetic, electric, galvanic, acoustic, solar, all are all governed by the triune streams of celestial infinity. Now here's some of the Keeley jargon, it's quite confusing, but if you study it long enough, you'll begin to get a hand on what this man's trying to tell us. All forces in nature are mind forces. That's quite a statement. The only source that could possibly generate this kind, these kinds of varied effects would have to be a scalar source. That we could take that scalar, source, scalar force and twist it in different ways and get these different forces from it. He's telling us we can do this. The streams of celestial infinity are these, this, the scalar forces coming from the, the higher dimensions, beyond the third dimension. Mind force is a scalar force. Mind force is a long sought, undifferentiated, non-observable, non-motion scalar potential. Undifferentiated means it's just whole and it's balanced. When you differentiate it, it becomes unbalanced, which we're going to cover. And uh, to give us a little bit of background so that we, can, we have something to work with as we proceed, on the left column we have the seven uh, classifications of matter and energy that Keeley came up with. At the bottom we have molecular, which is molecules, and further up are the atoms that make up the molecules, and above that are what he called the etheric. To us today, the upper left-hand corner is the quantum world the muons and the gluons and the photons. That's the etheric level of matter. The top one, whoops. The top one, the compound inner etheric, that's mind force. That was Keeley's term for the mind force. So down on the right, lower right-hand corner, we've got the 3D materiality, everything that we can sense and all. This is where modern man is today. You know, we deal in the physical world. But we want to go up to this corner up here because this is the source of all of this. So if we can go to the source and start engineering with the source, we're no longer messing around with symptoms and effects, which only give us limited capability. In the Walter Russell paradigm, he talks about the non-motion or the axes about which uh, dance, these polar motions that create, uh, for instance, magnetism. Um, <clears throat> the axis itself is a non-motion polarizing state of scalar energy, but once it's polarized or differentiated in the two poles, like positive and negative, then we get the motion. We don't get any motion until we differentiate that scalar. So what is motion? All motion is thought, 
and all force is mind force. For instance, Keeley made these machines and he'd go to the wall on the other side of the laboratory and draw a symbol on the wall and the motor would start. So he understood the connection between mind and machinery because uh, he engineered them, he built them, he demonstrated them to everybody. And he also did experiments where he measured the actual force in a single thought. So there's power there. There is power in this mind force to be liberated. So when we consider motion as thought, then we've got a guy over here who only is pretending to be in motion. He's just staging a photograph. But this guy over here is is dead set intentional to win this race and his mind is driving his body which drives that bicycle. It is his desire, his will, his intention to make things happen. All motion is mind motivated. This is by Walter Russell. So you want to get up out of your chair and go someplace, you have to make a decision to get up out of that chair and a decision or your intention to go do whatever it is you're going to go do. It's the mind that starts everything. He had these beautiful charts. This is just one of them where he shows that mind force, the scalar force, which is a mind force, can differentiate down through his lock potential uh, scale that he had developed and it creates all matter. All matter comes from mind force. From the the earlier chart, we had the four squares on the chart. The upper left-hand corner is the mind force, and it breaks down through that left-hand column. Mind particles create gluons, gluons create quarks, quarks create photons, photons create electrons, electrons are in atoms, and atoms are molecules. It's a direct path. So when we say that the scalar is a perfectly balanced state of affairs and it doesn't manifest to us in our 3D world, we cannot perceive it. But once it does become polarized, we, it, it, comes, it becomes polarized by disturbing its balance. So we disturb its equilibrium. Once, it, once that equilibrium is disturbed, it naturally wants to get back into that balanced state. And it's at those two points where we disturb it and where it goes back that we can attach our wheel work and get our power, usable power from it. And here's what Keeley said, it is really a mouthful, but polar and depolar differentiation result in rotary motion, like in the dinosaur. Inflowing sympathetic streams with expression of radiant energy also give rise to rotation. Here's two different ways to get rotation. From the seventh subdiv subdivision, the compound interetheric, or the soul of matter, all forms of matter receive their introductory or first impulse. So you have the mindset and the first introductory impulse is a thought. It's a desire, it's a will, a projection of will <coughs> that disturbs that equilibrium. Disturbance of equilibrium then is cause of observable motion from non-observable stillness or scalar. You know, the still sky and these jets plow through it. And this is another metaphor, by the way, that the still sky and the jets plowing through it is the disturbance, and it sets up a polarization, which is high compression, cold air, creates that, that uh, condensation. From this becomes that. So we start from the balance, which is uh, non-motion, non-observable. Take a seesaw, for example, two kids on a seesaw. If the seesaw is perfectly engineered and is perfectly balanced and the two kids are sitting there still, which is not possible, but if they were sitting there still, then that is, a, is another metaphor for your scalar energy. So then we have to create the non-polar forces with the observable motion. Thank you. When the two kids start to move on a seesaw, and a seesaw starts to move. And a seesaw wants to get out of balance, it wants to get back in balance, out of balance, back in balance, and that's the natural flow of things. And we can use these, pre these principles, these basic principles, in our engineering, developing our engineering models. So 
So what disturbs a neutral scale or mind equilibrium? This, the disturbance would have to be sympathetic to that being disturbed. Because if I weren't, you wouldn't have any effect on it. <clears throat> in a media of sympathetic neutral mind, the disturbance would have to be in a, a syntropic, focused, clear thought, idea, or concept. And we know in our mind lessons, you know, everybody's taking classes here on how to, how to make your life better. They teach you how to use your will force, uh, affirmations, all this type of stuff. But the one common principle is a clear, clear thought. And you hold that thought, and you make it strong, you're empowered with your emotions, and you release it. And that becomes one of the forces that disturbs this equilibrium. And in the case of you want something positive to happen, that's what we're talking about, not the negative stuff. Clear, focused intent or idea causes a local centropic condensation resulting in local polarization. Once it's polarized, you got your motion. Uh, we got a new word here, the, uh, whoops. the centropic or centropy is a word that I coined. Um, everybody knows what entropy means, it means chaos. The world, you know, the modern science says the world is running down and going to hell. And that we're all doomed because of this crazy idea. Well, um, there's another side to life. There's a side of life that's growth. Now, if you take a tree seed and you plant a seedling, this tree will pull to itself the water, the nutrients, the carbon dioxide, everything it needs to create more of itself. And at some point in this cycle, it will peak over the cycle of growth or life enhancement and the uh, preponderance towards entropy will set in where the tree will get old and it'll die and then it'll decay and go back to earth, back to its elements from whence it came. So the centropy is the life side of everything. We can use the centropy to drive energy into our machines. And centropy is a longitudinal function we're not going to get into that because it gets too technical, but the, we're, we're here interested in, this, in the life side of things, which is what SVP is, the science we're developing. So we use the polarization factor in, in a local densification and rarefaction, which is your waveform. That's all that means. You condense and you expand out, and that results in vortex motion. The vortex rotations form about a center and as we enhance the centropy sign of it, the center becomes more and more energized, more and more compacted, and eventually that's how the atoms and molecules are formed. But it's also how we build energy into a device like this. It can't just sit here and operate. It's got to have an energy source. And, and um, it is open to various energy sources that we could do that. With well, different kinds of disturbances, is the same as differentiated gravity, localized entropic densification or attraction to the center. Simultaneously gives rise to radiant dispersive radi rarefaction. <clears throat> In this case, we're showing two conductors coming together, the, uh, two electric wires coming together. The circulating, the vortex around the wires represents the electrons flowing on the outside of the wire to a center. And this is just standard physics. But these two forces are both centropic forces, and they have to come together. That's what they do. They naturally pull together because they're sympathetic to each other. When they're sympathetic, they are naturally attracted. And when they hit that center point, you get this huge spark. Which goes out 90 degrees from the incoming force. That's your magnetic radiation or dispersion, like in an antenna from a radio broadcast. Spark emits heat and light. The four plus plus of Walter Russell's locked potentials, 90 degrees to the centropic contraction. This process Russell called voiding. The two poles want to void. They're out of balance. You artificially create these two forces out of balance, and they naturally want to come together. Any electrician knows what happens. You know, it just has to come back together. So we can do that. That's part of our engineering ideas. And we wind up with this. When those forces start dancing about each other, they unleash amazing forces. And it's a simple thing. We don't have to go out and pump fuel out of the ground or create nasty radio radioactive materials. 
we can use nature itself because these are principles that nature uses. I'm going to move your mic up just a little bit. Now, let's see. All right, let's try it again. Look at it one more time. Let's try that. All right, thank you. So there's different degrees of disturbance. We can disturb a hole without rupturing it and still preserve the integrity. For instance, rub your finger around a wine glass, the whole glass starts to vibrate. So we're causing, by that intermittent contact with the glass, you're causing a vibration in the glass, and we can hear it. So it comes out like sound. Or we can disturb it with extraordinary force and shatter the whole thing which you can do with a voice or a hammer, whichever one's handy. But we have control over that. One scalar hole is just one big huge potential out there, no matter where we are, what we're doing. It's non-motion. It's just one big huge scalar state. And, and what we're saying here is there's just one huge universe of scalar energy. The matter that we encounter, whether it's an atom or a molecule, is a, is a localized disturbance of that scalar. It doesn't have existence other and by itself divorced from the universe. It is an inherent manifestation of the scalar in a given location for whatever we want to use it for. So it's one mind consciousness the depolar, which means it has no polarization to it, it, is purely neutral, that's what depolar means, and it becomes polarized, and it gives us our life. That's what life is. Life is the polarization of this one force that Keeley called the life force of all matter and all entities, all living beings, is simply a polarization of that depolar state. And we have access to it when we stop our thinking. Thinking disturbs the, the uh, scalar mind, neutral mind force. That's what disturbs it. And you know it yourself because your thinking causes activity in your life. Activity is motion. If you meditate deeply, which means you're shutting down the thinking processes and you go back to experience this one whole consciousness there's no motion, and yet you have access to inspiration, intuition, creativity, all comes from that quiet. So that's the undifferentiated scalar mind force, and we have that within us. If we simply stop being busy, and that means busy in your mind. So what is differentiation? <clears throat> Disturbance of the scalar equilibrium or balance. Refraction or splitting of the undifferentiated, non-observable, one whole scalar mind into many. Refraction of undifferentiated, non-observable polar state or condition into observable polar states of motion. That's what we're after here. For instance, in music, we can, we can take the metaphor of a fundamental and a scale. Let's say C, for instance. That's the one wholeness of the scale you're going to create because out of C, when you first sound the C, it will sound its first harmonic of the overtone series, and all the other notes fall out of the combination of those two, either additive or subtractive synthesis. In this case, we're using the prism to take the undifferentiated light, which you can't see, coming from the sun, it breaks through the prism. This is called refraction, and it's just another word for differentiation. We're going to split out all of these aliquot parts. That's an important term. The aliquot parts contained in this, which doesn't look like it has anything in it. This is the undisturbed scalar force right here. And it can break out into the things we can see and observe and touch and feel. But prior to the differentiation, you can't see any of it. It's non-observable. The one divides into two mutually and intermittently 
assimilative and dispersive polar states. So it contracts to the center and goes away from the center. And the split mine, the forces, uh, oops, okay. And here's another metaphor for what we're speaking about. It has the appearance. The one has the appearance of two. <clears throat> it's all one. So if you get a wave, you can't have a wave without both halves to it. You don't have a wave. So it, it's, it's like a universe where we can see things that seem to have reality, but the reality is actually behind what we're looking at. And here's a, another way of uh, expressing some of these terms. <clears throat> when the polar state, when a depolar state differentiates into a polar state of two seeming opposites, we wind up with entropy as chaos compared to centropy, which is the ordering of nature. It's the ordering force of nature. <clears throat> and these two columns simply represent uh, synonyms for those dispersive and contracting two states. And many people have compared these polar states to male and female, which is really good. I mean, it works. Um, we got our male side and we got our female side. And Russell expressed it with this graphic, uh, which embodied a lot more information. If, if you really want to understand the polar states, Russell is the guy you want to study because he laid out all these graphics. Now, once, they, once it differentiates into two polar states, as we saw in the electric spark, each wants to become the other. And they will clash together, they will mutually antagonize each other until they meet in the center and they start to have this dance. They want to avoid one becoming the other. So it's not two separate states. It's, it's one compound state that interchanges its poles back and forth. So it's a compound mechanism. Uh, according to Keeley, when they clash together through the law of assimilation, that's the process that brings them, that, causes, that, that describes this dance, through the law of cycles is when, that, when the two clash together in high energy states, they will create a series of overtones of inharmonic quality, and that creates the dispersive state. So they both have their origin in each other, which we'll cover that a little bit. And the principle of regeneration is Russell's principle that talks about once they neutralize each other and they become neutral, then they clash against the neutral zone, so to speak, and then they come back to forming the centropic force. And they do that over and over and over. Russell called that the universal heartbeat. So there's this natural energy flow going on. It's just like a big, huge heartbeat. And we can attach our machinery to this heartbeat. Here we have it set up as a, as a vibrating string. As a string, like for instance on a guitar, as they vibrate back and forth, it's one string assuming two different positions that seem to be opposite, but they're not. They're constantly becoming each other. And in that dance between the polar states, there is a third state called a neutral state. Sir. Can you give us the marine belted out there? <laughs> uh, we've had a few requests so you could talk a little louder. I've cropped the mixture as far as I can go on the eat to try to get. If you, <clears throat> if you could talk a little louder, sir, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. I will give it my best. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So the two polar states are linked by a mutual neutral state. <clears throat> so there's actually three states in the vibration. And the vibration can become either of the two, but it remains neutral all the time. It's like the old philosopher's stone. It can change everything else, but it itself remains unchanged. So that's the great neutral state. Here we have a pendulum, an image of a pendulum. The neutral is where the pendulum is suspended and it can control and govern the motions of the pendulum side to side. In Keeley's terminology, he pictured this three states of motion in this configuration, which I've got all over my website, 
So you've got the, the positive, the negative, and the neutral states combined as a single unit. Here's another diagram from Walter Russell. He shows the poles as complex entities. So if there's a positive and a negative and a neutral, which is one of the problems I recognized in the mathematics I've been reading from Raymond, that's where I first noticed it. He's treating the, the electric poles and the magnetic poles as monopoles, mo uh, monolithic poles, that they're just a single negative and a positive charge. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me and it doesn't fit in the Keeley paradigm and it doesn't fit in the Walter Russell paradigm, these poles are complex entities. For instance, uh, states are in harmony with each other, Concord for instance, they will mutually attract towards each other. So the centropic stream that contracts to a center has to be a harmonic uh, complex. All the energy coming in has to be in a harmonic relationship. Otherwise, it won't attract to the center, it will disperse. So if there's a discord in it, then we've got the law of repulsion, which drives everything mutually apart. So like attracts like in this vibratory universe, and, and uh, dis unlike, dislike things disperse from each other. So those are the two forces. And the causative nature of those two states are what we call these, the uh, scalar aliquot parts because they determine what is harmony and what is discord. So we can look at the pole all by itself and ignore the cause of the state of that pole, or we can go into the cause, the, the uh, scalar aliquot parts, and understand why the same media contracts or expands. And that's what I don't see in some of the scalar math. They attempt to do that, but they seem to be missing something. So they're not simple mono, monopoles. Electricity and magnetism are two aspects of the same thing, what I just said. Electricity contracts together and causes spark. Magnetism mutually repels and spreads out. So the, for instance, the radiation from a radio broadcast station, you pump electricity into it, generates a magnetic field that radiates out into, the, into your neighborhood. So it's the magnetism that radiates out, not the electric. So why is there so much difference between these two forces when they come from the same source? Electricity is mutually attractive, centropy. There are two polar electric streams attract each other to void, which causes a spark. At the spark or voiding, the vibrations create discords, which are entropic or mutually repulsive. So they start scattering out all over the place. Magnetism is a repulsion, entropy, and so we've got a definition now, of a causative definition as opposed to engineering just the perceived effects. So here we run right smack into a real paradox. Opposite poles attract, void, then repel reciprocally. If we take two bar magnets and bring them together, north and south poles, they will uh, uh, match up. But when you do that, the, the two poles then migrate to the furthest extension of the magnet. So here are two opposite poles trying to get away from each other. They repel each other. And Russell first brought this up, and it seemed like a real enigma. But as we go through it, we can begin to get a handle on why this phenomenon takes place and maybe even why science chooses to ignore it, because maybe they don't have an answer for it. So if we take the, suit, the, two, the same two magnets and we apply Russell's uh, indig numbers, which are right on, you can't hardly, hardly read those, but once they join, the whole, this whole scale is from here to here, and there are two different scales from here to here, but once they match, then it becomes one scale. So they combine their states and become a whole other entity altogether. And that can't happen if they're monopoles. Opposite poles repel, so poles are not monopole. OK, 
Keeley often talked about the triple stream, polar streams, and until we can understand the scalar basis for these polar activities, his work didn't really make any sense. But now we're beginning to understand what he was saying. We can take these three poles and mix them in any configuration we want within each stream and derive degrees of attraction, degrees of repulsion, how much energy it's got into it, how much repulsive energy it's got into it, and it's an in, it becomes an engineering issue at this point. It's no longer just a theoretical happenstance. So whether it's a, a positive or negative, that quantity of positive and negative is determined by the aliquot scalar components. And here again, we're reiterating what we said. Each of the three can be the other. In fact, it's their desire to do so. And in that clash of interest is where we can hook our machinery. Now here's another Walter Russell image. This is the way he depicted it. So you got a, a male force and a female force. They're always being attracted together. He calls them red and blue, which is apt. And the center part is your neutral part, which is the spiritual side of humanity that brings it together. If you consider male and female like uh, John Gray does, or, I mean, we've got these opposites and everything, and yet we're still attracted to each other. We still have this ongoing life activity between two poles that on the physical appear different, but on the higher level, we're all one and the same. Here's another Walter Russell image. We take the one mind force, uh, the one scalar force, and we can divide it up into any sort of, there, there's hundreds of different kinds of matter and different kinds of energy states, and we can take that one scalar force and divvy it up pretty much any way we want to do it. So here's another metaphor. We're going to take a guitar player, uh, neutral scalar mind. He's sitting there dreaming up this music. He wants to play some music in his mind. The neutral scalar mind controls polar observable motion of his hands. So in the center we have the will, he desires to do this. His right hand governs the intensity, notes and chords, and his left hand the pitch and the notes, but it's his mind that governs this whole process. So out of the mind comes this directed activity, directed intelligent activity. So non-observable thought is the infinite exciter that disturbs compound interetheric mind equilibrium causing observable polarization and motion. Another Walter Russell design where he shows the mind in the center differentiates into all these other aspects of our lives, whether it's love or ideals or knowledge, all these are aspects of mind and consciousness. But it all comes from the one mind expressing itself in different ways. In our case, we want motion And in our dinosphere, it has been said over and over and proven that this has a consciousness in it. So we have within its construct an element of this mind force. And that has been a point of much discussion. But consciousness is not limited to biological beings. Mind, mind is everywhere and everything is made from mind. So there's no reason why we can't have mind in machinery or in anything else we'd like to have it. It is the scalar force, and we can differentiate it into rotary motion or into life's activities, whatever we choose. We have free will. So there is one potential of undifferentiated, non-observable, non-motion scalar mind force, like when you're meditating, it's just awareness. To transform this one potential into usable kinetic energy, it must be differentiated into observable polar states, these polar states are tripolar, 
allowing rhythmic balanced interchange between the two sides, or periodic motion, which is vibration, and are therefore observable and usable. And that concludes this. This is my website. You can go to that and you have just thousands of pages of this research. There's videos, pictures, graphics. Um, it's the beginning of a whole new science. In fact, we're we wanted, we start a new project to develop a whole new mathematics based in symbolism. Symbolism appeals directly to the higher mind and we can get away from this intellectual ego mind directly with symbolism instead of trying to read this very messy inherited standard mathematics that we're saddled up with that nobody can read anyway. So, anybody have any questions? Back there. Do we have any questions? So, yeah, do I? Um, could I have any like tomorrow over here? Uh, uh, let's, let's keep the thrust right here. Uh, well, let's keep these, this thrust off, okay? And I'm going to ask you to stand right here when you come up for questions. Mitch? Can you tell us about and possibly demonstrate the device on the table? <coughs> These are called dinospheres. Uh, in Keeley's time, he made many, many versions of this particular design. And in the old photographs, you'll see many different design patterns that he made. And he was building those to be primarily a uh, power source to drive industry, sawmills, locomotives, and the like. We built this one in the winter of 95 and 96, thinking we were developing a free energy machine, because we read the stories, you know, and we wanted to have that power too. We took this to an energy conference in Denver in the summer of 96. And I come back from the lunch one day, and there's all these women standing around like this with their hands up, all around it. And that was a pretty strange thing to find. And I asked them what they were doing. And this lady said, we're standing here feeling the love come from this machine. Yeah, I didn't think it was so funny either. <laughs> because I wasn't feeling any energy. And they were all feeling the energy because they all nodded in agreement to what she just said. And it was like my whole life changed in that moment because I wasn't feeling it, they were, I built it, I should be feeling it if anybody's feeling it. She chose to call that feeling love. So I began a whole new in, a path of investigation to understand what was going on with this. And we took it to a center in, in Tulsa and we had hundreds of people come around it and I told them they were the guinea pigs. I want them to tell me what they're experiencing around it, if anything. And that began the building of a whole new paradigm because we started seeing people being healed physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. We couldn't equate that to a mechanical device. How is that possible? And a whole plethora of other things. In the meantime, we're trying to understand the physics of the scalar thing that we're talking about. We didn't know it was scalar at that time. Um, to such an extent that we can differentiate it to get the polar motions to get the driving factor. So we're still piecing this together and we will have it solved eventually. That's the story. Dale, in your presentation you've, you've woven in some of uh, Keeley's uh, thoughts and quotes and then also Walter Russell with those illustrations. Was there any connection between the two people, or do you find that Walter Russell was sort of speaking the same language? Uh, do you mean, did they know each other phys in the physical world? I don't think they did. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Keeley was an old man when uh, Russell was born, and I don't know that they ever met. I don't think they did. I met Lau once and asked her, did, did Russell know about John Keeley? And her answer was, I'm sure he did. But it's not much of an answer. 
but their, their, their philosophies and science parallel each other. And I need to say this. The Keeley material is very sketchy. It's just magazine articles, newspaper articles. We really don't have a lot of Keeley's work. So it's full of holes. It's full of holes and contradictions or seeming contradictions. And Walter Russ was somewhat the same way. There's, he painted this huge paradigm, but when you read it, there's holes in it and there's, there's paradoxes and there seems to be contradictions. But when you put the two together, they fill each other's holes. And it's really an amazing matchup because Russell got his from divine inspiration and we're pretty sure that Keeley got it from the same source. So they just match up very well. Hello, thank you, that was a great talk. From the new research from the, uh, the new cyclotrons suggest that as you decrease the time from energy to, from mass to energy, you increase the energy exponentially, which suggests that if our thoughts are energy and you had an unobstructed thought, you could create infinitely. In other words, one single thought with zero time, the energy would be infinite. So what's your uh, reaction to that? Um, well, you're right. You know, the mind has infinite power. The scalar mind has infinite power. Once it differentiates, it starts to lose that potential and it becomes more of a defined or discrete energy quantity. And in the modern physics, where they're accelerating these particles and trying to crack them together, that's a derivative, direct derivative of the new Newtonian mindset that everything is matter and energy originates in matter. Well, that's nonsense. We know that matter originates from energy. And when they try and class these particles together, they don't, they're not paying any attention to these two laws, the law of repulsion and law of attraction. So they have discordant particles trying to cram them together with more discordant particles, and all you're gonna get is more chaos. And that's exactly what our society is experiencing now. They're taking negativity and pounding more negativity into it without realizing that if they used harmony, these things would come together without any difficulty whatsoever. No byproducts that kill on us, no poisons. So they're just not paying attention to the full picture. And it's really basic physics when you look at this. It's no rocket science here. It's just a different way of looking at it, a general way to look at it. We can engineer with love and peace, which is harmony, and bring these elements together in a new forms and new processes that nurture us instead of killing us because they're not paying attention. Is that good? Is that good? Yes, hi. Um, I've, I've loved this beautiful machine for many years and there's one thing I would like to draw your attention to and the people in here, they can't see it very well, but maybe you could uh, say a few more things about it. There are uh, pins that are radially arranged. They're, they're protruding out of the center there and there's, there, there's specifically different um, lengths and I believe that that would be associated with, with a harmonic that perpetually goes in and out of there and if you know anything more about that I'd like you to speak on that. Okay, well the dinosphere is designed to mimic these two polar states that we were talking about. You got the contractive harmonic state which is done with the sphere. The sphere resonates like in the Helmholtz spheres. They resonate to a perfect pitch and that will, without creating discord, so it bring, creates a harmonic state in the center of the sphere, the contractive force bringing in a centropy. And once it reaches a certain point of, of uh, voiding where there's enough energy being pounded into the center of the sphere, then the overtones are created spontaneously through the law of cycles and it drives it apart. 
So then we've, we, and it does it intermittently. So we've got contraction and expansion, contraction and expansion. So this is like an artificial heart. And in those motions that come together and spread apart, they actually do a swirling pattern like the square dancers on the screen, and that is the rotation of the dinosaur. Thank you for asking that. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, Dale Pond. Thank you. Thank you.